Hey friends, thank you for tuning in to the Occlusal Table where we bridge dentistry with business, culture, and current events. I'm your host, Taylor Jackson, and today we'll be taking a deeper look into general practice residencies and how to match into your top program. All right, let's get started. My name is Emerald Ferguson. I am originally from Nassau, Bahamas. I went to undergrad at Georgia State University and I'll be going to OU College of Dentistry. Hello everyone, I'm Brandon Davison, originally from Macon, Georgia. I went to Georgia State University as well. And I'm going to um, Mercy Hospital in St. Louis, GPR program. How y'all doing? My name is Joseph Rollins. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. I went to Fisk University and I'll be attending the Richard L. Rudabosch uh, GPR in Indianapolis. How's everybody doing? My name is Harry Wallace. I'm from Miami, Florida. I uh, went to Hampton University for undergrad and I'll be going to University of Washington for my general practice residency. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Lynn. I went to University of Houston and I'm going to be going to the Denver Public Health Hospital uh, over in Denver. All right, perfect. Well, these are my classmates. So happy for them uh, to go into GPR. So let's go ahead and dive into some questions. So GPR, AEGD, what's the difference and why did you choose to go to a GPR over an AEGD? Um, so I think generally speaking, you know, AEGDs are a little closer to a, ch a little closer to what feels like a fifth year of dental school, um, not to sort of knock AEGDs at all. Um, but just my understanding was, you know, they're, they're a little bit more private practice based, a little more, you know, focused on still keeping up with you know academia and stuff like that whereas gprs are generally you know hospital based and you know you're doing a lot more emergencies you're doing a lot more you're dealing with a different patient population um that was my understanding but again you know gprs and agds really are program to program so you know some agds are run like gprs some gprs are run like agds so while that is the general idea, you, it really is um, based on the program. Yeah, and kind of to piggyback on what Mike said, it is really program to program from what I understand. And I know like a lot of research should be done if, you, if you're thinking about the two, because if I'm not mistaken, if you want hospital rights, you wanna work in a the hospital, then I think you have to do a GPR. But it just depends on what you want to do or what you're looking for in your additional year, two years, or however much time you want to spend in that. Like if endo or pros or period or something that you want more experience in, then you may be more suited for this AG or this GPR. So it, it kind of just varies and just depends on your research that you do behind it. Yeah, and to kind of, I guess, um, go off of what Brandon said, for me specifically, I wanted to go to a GPR where it was very pedo heavy. So eventually I want to go into pediatric dentistry. So I did research and just seeing which um, GPRs offered that here within the US and the GPR I'll be going to is mostly we see children because it's based out of a children's hospital and the other times will be in the VA and that's mostly when I'll see adult patients. So it's really just geared to what you want to do in the future. Yeah, um, I think more, more programs are starting to kind of integrate all aspects, but the reason I chose a GPR over AGD, I just wanted to see more diverse populations, more diverse uh, medical histories. Um, I know GPR I'm going to is at the VA, so you're going to see a lot of different complex cases, uh, 
you have different medical rotations um, just to see how your cohorts in the medical field uh, you know operate and I, I just thought that was interesting also having an anesthesiology rotation yeah I'm, I'm very similar to Joe uh, an anesthesia rotation anesthesiology rotation was kind of something I was looking for um, and also just to be in a hospital base and kind of broaden my scope to kind of see several different things and it's just one year um, I just wanted to feel more comfortable when I get out that I know and I've seen just about anything that's really going to come through my door. Um, so that's kind of why I chose the GPR because it has that hospital base and you just have more, in my opinion, more opportunities to kind of see different things. And even like all of those are good points and those, a lot of those points we brought up were a broad scheme of things like setting us up for things we want to do or what we more so feel like the program is suited for or caters to our needs, so like our, the experiences that we want. But even on a, on a smaller scale, for example, one of our classmates chose to do an AGD over a GPR because she didn't want to be on call on weekends and she was at a hospital. So even things like that. So if you had a GPR, let's say if you had a GPR in Nashville versus Los Angeles, a lot of times you have to live within a certain mileage of whatever hospital program you're in. So living within the vicinity of a GPR in Nashville versus in Los Angeles is a completely different price range. So that's a, there are a lot of other things that go to too. Yeah, it depends on the lifestyle that you want, right? You know, um, and that'll kind of dictate what kind of program that you wanna choose. Um, but also going into those that did pass versus those that did match. Um, what was that process like for those that did pass? And what was the process like for those that didn't match uh, when selecting the program that you're going to? Well, for me, I actually started with pass, but I applied for match but I didn't select any match program. So I basically gave match some free money. Um, I, the past, the past was, uh, in my opinion, a little bit less stressful because once you interview, maybe the next day or up to a week later, you'll know if you've gotten that, uh, that spot. It's bad because if you haven't interviewed anywhere else, it's, you have to make that decision. Like, am I going to go here now? Or do I want to wait and risk see if I can get somewhere else? Uh, so in my opinion, I think any, if you do pass or match, you should only apply to schools that you really want to go to. I know match, you rank them, but um, I would say just apply to anywhere that you say, I want to go here. This would be my ideal place. So if you are offered that position, you can take it and keep moving. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I think match just kind of allows you more time to consider where you really wanna be. But the downside is that it's a very long, stressful process. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, things work out as they should, but it just is very long. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess, forgive me if it was already explained, if you already know the difference between pass and match, but pass is more so like, more so of an open interview. So it's usually a little bit earlier than match. So for instance, my program was passed. So I interviewed in September and got an offer like a week and a half later. So at that point, either I accepted it or you keep moving on and hope you get another interview or you wait until match the next year, a few months later to see if there's another program that you like, that you, you're you interested in going to. So I know Joseph and I talked about it a lot, but I tried not to put so much money into match just because I knew I was doing pass and match was months later. So I kind of slow walked it, I guess you could say, and tried to save money. It might not be the best idea, but I definitely agree with what he said and choosing the programs that you really 
think you're interested in. Otherwise, it's it's gonna be probably a little bit more confusing. Yeah, I would say there's definitely pros and cons to both. And I mean, Joe and Brandon definitely talked about the past pros and cons. Um, I think Emerald was talking about the, the match one. And this really is just, you have to deal with that anxiety and that stress of just, did they like me during my interview? And, you know, with past, you may find out that next day that you got accepted and they loved you. And with match, it's like, you have a great interview and then you have to wait two months to kind of put them in order and pray they put you in the same order to kind of make sure you're kind of matched. Um, so it's just a little more anxiety with it, but as Emerald was saying, <clears throat> you have the chance to kind of weigh your options a little better. So for me, as a chronic procrastinator, this worked a little better for me um, because I was able to interview and then kind of go back and be like, all right, well, I, I chose the school for X, Y, and Z, but now I can kind of go in depth before I rank them and actually pick what I really want to do versus how in past, they may call you the next day and you've only had this one interview and you have to make the decision right there. Um, so it really just depends on the person. But either way, I think you're going to be good. Yeah, I mean, I think I think everybody kind of nailed it. You know, it's I I, I definitely would um, hammer in though on that point of you know if you're going to pick a past program, make sure you really like that program because I had. One past interview um, at this program that, I mean, it was in the Northeast. So I was like, I guess I'll go. Um, and honestly, they didn't even, now that I think about it, I didn't hear anything from them in, in terms of a acceptance or, or rejection. I just didn't hear back from them. But looking back on it, I was just, you know, I was sort of like, uh, I don't really know if I even want to go here. And I kind of knew immediately after the interview um, that it wasn't really going to be a fit. Um, and that's, you know, some money I, I really could have saved. So I would say match is nice if you're not 100% sure where you want to go because, you know, like everybody said, you can field some options. You can really, you know, think like have an interview, take some time, think about it, think about other interviews write down, you know, pros and cons, write down where you think you're going to match. Because again, the thing about matches, yes, it's about what you want, but it's also about what programs want. Um, so you really got to, I mean, it's a, it's a match, you know, it's not a, you, know, you have to match up with the right program. So there's a little bit more to consider versus passes, just sort of a lot more traditional. Um, so I'm sure that there's, you know, plenty of good past programs out there for if, you know, you can find what you're looking for, but with match, it just, it's nicer to be able to field your options. And that's why I ultimately was like, I want to mostly consider match programs. So with moving forward into that selection process, right. And that application preparation, um, what were you looking for in a residency? Cause to me, it's like, okay, there's a hospital, there's these hospitals, you know, what made you want to select the ones that you wanted to apply for for pass? And what was the criteria for those that you selected for match? Was it like what Emerald said when she wanted one that was more pedo focused? Or just like what uh, Joe and Harry said that, you know, they wanted something that was more, you know, anesthesiology, um, you know, or having that rotation uh, focus? What was the um, baseline for you guys? Um, so for me, it was, you know, honestly, I didn't really know what I wanted um, specifically out of a program, to be honest. Like when I was applying, I was like, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm interested in, pro well, at the time I was kind of in between pros and perio and I just knew that, you know, hey, I just want more experience. I want to see more things. That's what I talked about in my um my personal statement, just like, I don't think I've seen enough to make an informed decision. So I want to go somewhere where I can see uh, a lot. And turns out every GPR says that that's, you know, what they can offer you. So that didn't really help narrow it down at all. Um, but as I was interviewing, um, you know, uh, with Denver, they said they did a lot of endo. 
Um, and during my interview, it kind of just clicked for me that, you know, I knew endo was sort of my weak area. Um, and I thought, you know, and I still do think it's really important to be a good general dentist before you become a specialist. Um, that, and that's not how everybody thinks. Like some people think, you know, hey, I never, I know I'm not going to end up and I'm never going to do it again. So I'm going to go into perio and that's cool. Like that's totally a valid um, train of thought, but that's just not how I think. Um, and I wanted to be able to round off my skill set. And no, I don't think I'm amazing at, you know, any one thing, but I do know that endo is my weak area. So if it's a GPR where you're going to get experience in everything, but they focus on the area that I'm the weakest, to me, that seemed like, okay, this is a good place for me to be. Also Denver is cool. So just, just made sense. Um, I think kind of the same thing. So for me, I think of a lot of us can kind of say that COVID kind of changed our experiences in the clinic. So I think it was really important for me to feel comfortable and competent in all of my skills. And I mean, I'm just being honest. I feel like right now I'm not where I want to be fully. So I knew that no matter where I went next year, I wanted to be in a learning environment and I wanted to be in a learning environment that was geared towards my future. So that's why I specifically put, picked OU. Um, I also wanted to see as much as I can. And I think in a hospital setting, you kind of don't know what's gonna be thrown at you um, all the time, especially for me, I'll be on call a lot um, and kind of just talking to the residents that are there now, you can just expect any and everything. So that was more of the experience that I was leaning towards. And that's specifically why I chose to do a GPR first. Um, I think that was really important for me and considering where I wanna be in my life. <laughs> Also the cost oh. of living too, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like it's really important uh, for when you choose these programs to know the cost of living and how much you're really intended to receive. Um, and just, I guess, what, what is it called? Like the quality of life, like what you want. Yeah, the, um, that's, that's something that's actually really important. Um, for me, I just kind of looked at the money that they were going to offer me, and I was like, oh, that's a lot of money, but I just didn't think Seattle was expensive. I just never thought to look into it, and to realize that Seattle is one of the most expensive cities to live in kind of threw me off a little bit, um, but the reason I kind of chose my, or chose the University of Washington to go for a GPR is also because of your own call, but with their program, you're on call in duos. You do everything with a partner, basically. Um, and that was something that was important to me because I know I can, I know just like uh, you guys were saying with COVID, you kind of missed out on a lot of things <clears throat> and having the opportunity to do it with a partner, someone from a different school, they may have learned different things. I can also learn from them. Um, cause just like me, they're a doctor as well. And we learn things, from different schools or different ways. And I just felt like that was an extra opportunity, opportunity to learn something, not only from the professor, but for my fellow resident, because we're working together all the time. Um, so that was the reason I also chose my GPR program. Quick question. What, um, how many people are in you guys' residency classes? Like, was that important to you? Like how many people were in there too? It was a, it was a factor. Um, I've got 10, I believe. And I thought it was like six to eight. Um, I mean, definitely not something that would make me like, oh, let me, you know, pull my application. But I, I, I did want like a little bit more of an intimate group. Um, I strongly believe in, you know, a small or low uh, student to faculty ratio. I think, you know, like NYU um, has, like anywhere from like 20 residents, I think, in their Brooklyn program. And I was like, eh, I mean, yeah, no, that's that's too much, you know. I, I think I think the sweet spot is anywhere from like three to to 10 or 11. Um, I mean, if if it's like a two-person or even a one-person GPR like, and you're the only resident, then I think that's 
great. You know, like you're really learning a lot. Like everybody's giving you everything they got. And that would be, that would be nice. But I mean, you, you still kind of want, you know, your co-residents to lean on to hang out with stuff like that. Yeah. Um, my program has a total of four. So when I was looking for programs, I basically wanted to be, wanted something that would help me be a well-rounded uh, clinician. So I'm interested in endodontics, but I always thought if I know how to do a little bit of everything, when, if I do decide to go into endodontics, I will be well prepared for what you might might not see. <clears throat> um, one thing I think you should also consider when looking at programs, you look at the the city that it is, and can you see yourself living there for one or more years? Um, you might just think, oh, I'm just going to be there for a year, and then I'm going to move somewhere else. But you never know; you might receive an opportunity to stay there for either in your residency or another practice and it's a great opportunity but do you want to stay there um so when i looked at it i said okay indianapolis it's a little too cold for me um I, but i can buy a coat and it's not that far from uh my family so i said you know if, if the opportunity presents to where i have to stay in indy for uh, a few more years, I could do that since it's not that far. Um, of course, cost of living, you want to look at all that. But when I looked at the program, I just wanted to see what all I would be exposed to. Um, and they just offered the most, the most experiences. I agree with what everyone else pretty much said. Um, cost of living is a big factor. Can you see yourself staying there long term if you get out, get opportunity? Um, like Mike Lynn said, if there's something that you know you want more experience in, like endo, then a program that has endo kind of will be more beneficial. Um, size did kind of play a factor. So my program was three, sometimes I have four residents if they accept a second year, like a PGY2 in the program at the hospital. But experience is definitely so. I wanted to have a program where I got a, a lot of experiences in dental school and I'm grateful for it. But in dental school, you're learning. So you, I guess for like a better word, there's a cap on it because they want you to learn and not rush things and not compromise quality for quantity, basically. You still want to do quality work regardless. And the program that I'm going to, um, the GPR Mercy Hospital in St. Louis, it's a, a federal grant. They have a federal grant. So it's a federally funded program where they don't have a shortage of patients. So I know that I always have patients because they have a, a waiting list where there's never a day pretty much where you'll have an empty chair unless you just say, hey, I can only see three patients right now. Like, that's my capability. But when you're ready to see five, you can move up to five. You're ready to see six, you can move up to six. So as you grow and kind of learn, they have the quantity of patients and so large that they can't kind of keep up with the way you're moving. And they do a variety of things. They have specialists. Um, I even, I guess another reason I should say that I chose the program is because uh, before the year before that graduating class before me actually went to the program and she was talking about her experiences there and how she enjoyed it. And even her second week there, she was doing um, root canals on second molars, which we don't do in dental school. So she was learning things pretty much right off the back. If she was ready and she was prepared and they knew she prepared for it, she asked questions and then, I mean, the sky's the limit basically. So they kind of, it felt like a good fit and something that I, I needed and I wanted. So then with diving right into the application, um, any tips for building your CV? Did you guys do research? Did you guys 
have leadership positions, um, different clinical experiences, jobs outside of dental school. What do you think were the aspects of your CV um, that you've gathered over your years in dental school that made you stand out um, in the sea of applications? All of the above. <laughs> so research, working, and not just, not just pointless things or like just fluff or just clutter on your on your CV because some things you have to eliminate anyway. So if you worked at CVS during dental school, then okay, <laughs> were you a pharmacist? Is, is it going to help you prescribe medications to your patients? So some things you get rid of anyway. But if you do meaningful research or if you shadowed in dentistry or worked in dentistry or even things around campus and you were involved, the more balanced you are and the more you can handle even on paper, even if you were just the person that typed everyone's name on, on your research, the more you can balance and handle on paper, the better it looks because there it's competitive. I'm, on paper, if I were to, to get a resume from 50 different people from 50 different dental schools. We all took the same classes. A lot of people have similar grades. Um, whether you're involved in ADIA, ASTA, SNDA, all those things. So what, what's going to set you apart? What makes you different? So more, less is more, but somewhat because you have to condense it, but you want what you do have the content to kind of be important and move through and set you apart and be able to talk about it because you do get questions about it. So if you were the person that just typed your name on the research and you didn't do the research, I would not advise you to put it on your CV because that's probably the question you're gonna get. Like, tell me about this research and that won't be so good. Uh, I totally agree. Um, I think you start your CV as early as possible, but only put things that are relevant and that you were really interested in um, because I had, like he said, they might ask you questions on, on, on things. And it was some things that I put on my CV that the program directors that I were interviewing with actually were interested in as well. So we talked about these different things um different research oh you worked here oh tell me about that i know that person boom 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 um you have to be ready so i wouldn't just put oh i did this and hope they don't ask about it because if they know somebody who did that or if they're interested in it they're going to question you on that Just to double back before someone jumps in, I guess, it's ironic because in my interview that I had, so I had one interview, I did pass, and I had a week to accept it, so I was done. So I really didn't have any other interviews. One of the specialists, the endodontists, when I was interviewing, she had a similar research project. So we kind of talked about it and it was like I'm so glad I reviewed this research and what we did and I was actually involved because who knew I mean she was an endodontist and of course it was like based on COVID-19 and SARS and dental implications and stuff like that that's what she wanted to talk about so just because she was like oh you had research published I did too you know blah 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 and that was the conversation so You'd be surprised who wants to know about what. Um, I think also it's important to like not limit yourself just within your dental school. So if that means that you go out and network with people or other dentists or specialists without um, or outside of your school, do that as well. And then in terms of CV and things that you kind of do like D1, D2 year, I know for me, I would always be like, oh, I'm going to write this down so that this is something that I can put on my CV. But I have terrible memory sometimes. So I think it might be important to like start a like spreadsheet or something like that and just put what the um, 
what that program was that you did or what that event was that you did a little like description of it and then maybe the date because all that stuff will be important when you actually sit down to do your cv um, same thing with shadowing opportunities if you go and shadow just don't go and not write what you kind of saw or were able to do that day so that when it comes to an interview and they're like what was that shadowing experience like you, you can maybe like bring out a log or be like this is what i did um, just little things like that it makes a difference yeah i would say definitely don't put anything on your app or your cv that you can't really kind of defend if you have to um i actually didn't put research on mine because the research i had started wasn't extensive enough for me to even talk about it so most of my stuff was actually volunteer work and kind of reaching to different doctors in different areas and kind of volunteering with them um and i during an interview one of the residents basically told me he liked my cv simply because it was so focused on volunteer work and everything i was basically doing had to do with helping some different type of denomination um and even just because we don't well one of the things i did i was able to shadow a dentist with special needs kids or special needs uh, care and they really enjoyed that or like seeing that because you don't see that in dental school so to emerald's point you kind of need to go out there and kind of venture and see different things just because you know you don't see it in dental school it doesn't mean it doesn't exist um and then kind of seeing that someone will take the initiative to kind of fill that gap in uh kind of boded well for me at least um i think so a few things first if you're a first year second year third year fourth year dental student watching this um the biggest tip I would say is at the beginning of every semester, just update your CV. Um, don't don't make it like a long thing. Like don't, because for me, I, I was okay about it. Um, but you know, with COVID and da 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 da. But like going through my CV, like trying to get that right while applying, I was like, damn, like did I did I do this? And like when did I do this? And thankfully, I have a Taylor Jackson, so I could go back and really uh, be like, I remember being there with you, so I'm going to put that on my CV too. Um, but I didn't have any particularly, like, totally terrible interviews, but there was, I don't remember who it was with, um, but there was an interview where somebody was asking me about my community service um just just one of the random ones because I I had like six or seven events listed and they asked me about just one of them and I was like ah, okay which which one was that again and and I mean thankfully it wasn't Denver um but it was you know okay yeah I kind of do need to to go back and review my CV a little bit closer um because people will ask I mean you you said you did it so tell me about it um you know, that's, it's all fair game. And I, I don't think they're doing it to try and be mean or malicious or like weed you out or anything, but it's like, uh, well, this is an interview and I don't really know what else to talk about. So let's talk about one of these things on your CV because you think it's interesting enough for you to kind of highlight. So let's talk about it. Um, I, I would agree though that, you know, all those shadowing experiences, I was asked about a lot of those. Thankfully, I did those in the summer, um, I guess right before interview season started, but during you know the, the application cycle. So all of those experiences were pretty fresh in my mind. Um, so I could talk about them pretty extensively. But you know, if you did some shadowing in your second year, um, maybe, you know, make sure you write that down or like, you know, you can talk about it or even, you know, just call the person you shadowed with and just ask them for tips on like what you should say, because they're, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to give you some talking points, you know? Um, so, yeah. So then you guys have also like expressed interest in different disciplines within dentistry. Um, did you talk about that in your personal statement or how did you frame your personal statement to where does it seem like, oh, I'm only going here just to get to my next step. So what exactly did you guys say for your personal statement? How did you guys format it? And how long did it take for you to make it? 
uh, I think so my personal statement, I talked a lot about, I guess I sort of alluded to it earlier, just how I um, wasn't, I was interested in all these different aspects of dentistry. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, make sure I can make an informed decision. My personal statement is all about, you know, making an informed decision. At the time, I was in between PROS and PERIO. Right now, I'm much more focused on PROS, but even, you know, being super Jeep, as people like to call it, um, that's becoming more interesting to me too. So I still am sort of thinking about what I want, but I also think it's really important and I didn't really hone in on this on my personal statement, but somebody did pick up on it, um, knowing what you don't want. Um, I, every interview I had when they asked me about, you know, what I wanted to do, like they all seemed happy that I knew for sure that I didn't want to do peds, not like they're happy I didn't want to do peds, but they, they were happy that I could say like, yes, for sure. Like, that's not what I want to do. Um, because at the end of the day, like that is also really important, you know, like you need to know what you absolutely cannot do or will not do um, and can only just really tolerate. <laughs> Sorry, Taylor. Um, but it's I just, right. <laughs> I think, um, and I don't, you, you don't need to like spend your entire personal statement talking about things you don't want. But when I was talking about all the specialties, like I didn't say anything about peds and somebody asked me about it. I was like, yeah, you know, what I, what I told her, I was like, I'm not really married to any of the specialties, but Peds and I are very amicably divorced. Um, we just, we don't get along and we respect each other and that's okay. Uh, and they really like that. So I think if you know you for sure are like, hey, perio is really boring and not interesting to me and I don't get it and I don't want to do it. People will respect you for that. You know, don't don't feel like you need to suck up to um, people. I mean, if there's a periodontist on faculty at, at that GPR and you just need to tell them straight up when you're in the interview, like, hey, like, I don't really like perio. You know, I just I just don't really like it. And that I don't not like you. I just don't really like your specialty. And they'll say, OK, I mean, that's fine. You know, so be confident in what you want and what you don't want in your personal statement. Um, I think for me, I guess my case is a little different because I did apply to PETA programs as well this cycle. So that makes it a little bit tricky <laughs> when you're writing a personal statement and also when you're asking for letters of recommendation. Um, so kind of like in the middle of the process, I, I guess it's okay to like say, oh, I don't know what I want. Um, and I think I kind of hit that somewhere in between applying um, and after seeing what interviews I got, what interviews I didn't get. Um, so for me, my personal statement, I kind of ended up changing a little bit just because initially it was very pedo um, specific. And then it turned more into exactly what Mike was saying. It was more of, I want to get more experiences um, wherever that would be. And then it was geared towards my specific program that I actually wanted to go to. So I guess mine was just like a little bit different um, in terms of trying to navigate between doing a specialty and doing a GPR. Um, same as my CV as well. I think it's important that if you're kind of going on the track that I went on, it's important that wh whoever's writing your letters of recommendation, they don't put specifically like, I recommend you to this pediatric dentistry program, um, just because if GPR see that, I don't know how they would feel about it. My GPR, I think that's something that they appreciate it because they're pedo heavy. Um, but in terms of other GPRs I applied to that I didn't get interviews to, I think that kind of was like a red flag to them. And I think that's something that we don't really talk about in the application process. So I think it's important to kind of navigate that now, um, but just do whatever, you know, um, is where you want to go and what you want to do in the future. For me, I guess it kind of changed, like I said, in the middle, but my CV and personal statement um, went back and forth, if that makes sense. Yeah, my personal statement was more of a, a, it was a mixture of a few things. It was a, a story of my progress from undergrad to now. It talked about things I like to do. And then it talked about where I saw 
myself going uh, after dental school, after residency. Um, and this goes back to what I said, you don't wanna just put anything in your personal statement. Um, I talked about how I went scuba diving for the first time and enjoyed it. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I went scuba diving in Cozumel. And the program director actually said, oh, I went scuba diving in Cozumel. And he asked me where I went, who I, what company I used. And he knew all the stuff I was talking about. Um, and so I think, like I said, you don't want to just put anything in there for fear that they might actually be interested in that. Um, I knew I did not want to do pedo either. Uh, so when it came about, I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really not interested in pedo, but you know, it's 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 an important specialty, you know. Um, yeah, but I told them I was interested in endodontics. And I say, yeah, I like endo. Um, it's interesting. I liked, you know, different aspects of pros and oral surgery. And it just talked about all my likes and, and things like that. I kind of took the route of Joe took. Um, I kind of told the story with mine. I really didn't talk about any type of specific specialty at all. Um, I kind of went down the route of this is how I got interested in the dentistry. This is why I chose to go here. And here's where I see myself in the future or what I'm trying to do. And really it was just me trying to convey to them that, hey, I don't really know what I want. And that's why I'm trying to do this general practice residency because I feel like there's so many different things in the world of dentistry that don't even fit into a specialty that are just so what niche. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I was trying to let them know I'm trying to find that for me because there's so many different things. Um, so my main thing was letting them know, hey, I'm really an open book at this point. I'm just trying to find what works best for me. And they seem to really kind of enjoy that because they kind of saw me as a blank slate. And it's like, okay, well, he'll kind of gravitate. And I actually had one of the, excuse me, one of the doctors say that, but like, oh, you're going to end up gravitating to what you really want. Um, and I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. Uh, so you don't really have to just go about saying, hey, I like this or I don't like this. Um, you can really just be kind of in the middle sometimes. It's, that's really where you are. You can be that. You just have to you know, be honest about it. So then with diving into letters of rec, um, how many did you guys get? Because I think you need like a minimum of three to have a total application, but then you can have a maximum of five. So did you guys just get all three or when did you guys ask um, or how did you ask your uh, letters, of recommend, letters of recommendation writers um, for those uh, letters? For me, I asked, as soon as possible. So as soon as I knew I had built a rapport with the professor and felt like we were on a good page and we knew each other, I'm a, I guess you can say a somewhat social person. Things. And um, so I talked to my professors, not just about dentistry or just about things in general, because I'm sure that would get boring if 200 students all day just wanted to come to you to talk about dentistry when you're eating lunch or walking to the restroom or going on the hall and trying to go home and get away from all these dental students. So, I mean, talk about things and you'll have connections and you'll know who you know more about or have spoken to more and kind of have a relationship with. And it won't be every professor, but the ones that you do know, if you know, hey, I know this person, I feel like they'll vouch for me. They have good things to say. They know a little about me. It won't be kind of just a generic, recommendation would they give anyone else because they really never saw me other than I got an in that class or or um, they they work at the school and I see them and wave every now and then. So as soon as I kind of knew who I wanted, I asked them. So even though it was early, maybe months, half a year, a year early, I knew it was coming up and I was like, hey, would you be one of my recommenders? And, Usually they'll be like, sure, just remind me. And so 
I kind of set it up early. So I knew people would flood them eventually because everyone needs them at the same time. So I asked ahead of time, then I come back maybe a couple months later beforehand and remind them and then the time came. They're like, oh yeah, I remember. So I kind of got them in a, it kind of expedited the process. Like I got my rec letters of recommendation pretty quickly because of that. So yeah, I just mainly asked people that I, I knew had a report with back in law school. Yeah, um, me, um, same thing. I I kind of started asking early, but I asked mostly people that I interacted with on a daily basis. So one of my uh, professors that I would go onto his rotation and we would just talk. You know, one day we might talk about dentistry, the next day we talk about the military or just life. And uh, I did that for all of my letter recommend uh, writers and everybody was very receptive. So I would say you, you want to start early. You want to let them know you as a person uh, as well as a student. So don't wait until a month before the application cycle is open or a month before a deadline because then they're just going to write something, throw it together. I think you should... I, I really started D2 year and just getting close to a lot of the faculty to where they knew me by name. They knew they would always ask, how's my day going? Things like that. So when it was time, they were like, oh, yeah, I'll write you one, you know, and keep moving. I think um, the same thing as everybody else, just start early, but also, I think sometimes people get worried like, oh, I don't know if this person will write me a letter or not. And I mean, the worst case scenario is that they say no, but the best case scenario is that they do say yes. And that can be someone that will actually make an impact on your um, application. So don't be afraid of that. Just ask and, you know, take whatever that they say. Um, I wasn't as early as Joseph <laughs> with my letters, um, but I think it's really important to kind of just build a rapport with whoever you're gonna ask, because some people might just take your CV and kind of copy and paste that um, uh, as a letter of recommendation. And I mean, that is not gonna be something that makes you stand out as an applicant. So just be very wise in who you choose. Yeah, I was the opposite of Joe and Hubbard. I procrastinate, uh, so I did that. Uh, but what you have to do is kind of make sure you know who you're asking. And I think what everybody says, is you want to make sure you have a rapport with them. That's a major thing. Because um, you don't want just a run of the mill letter recommendation because the other programs may actually hold that into a high account. Because these are people who've worked with you. And if they're saying, oh, you know, they just do basic work, do you want someone in your program that does just basic work? Um, so you want to make sure that the person you're asking, no matter what, when you're asking, um, you want to make sure they know you. You want to make sure there's someone who's going to speak highly of you and speak to the, the strengths they've seen in you, more so than the, the weaknesses or just anything. Um, but if you can, and as you should, definitely start early. Don't be like me. Start early, get everything in as soon as you can. Um, it's a whole lot less stressful that way. Yeah, um, I think another thing is don't feel bad about hounding people. Um, don't hound them all the time. Like, I, I don't know about every day, uh, <laughs> but um, if you need it, you need it, you know, uh, like, Actually, one of my letters of rec, um, the professor was, she left um, in the middle of the semester, but I still hadn't had my letter from her. Um, and I was in her office like every day in that last week before she left, because I was like, you're not leaving here without me getting my letter of rec. Um, so, 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 I mean, you need them, but, I mean, that's sort of a special case scenario, but you know, you, you all get my drift. Like you, you know, don't feel bad about bothering them because they're, they're professors, they're people, they have stuff going on in their lives and 
you're probably not the most important thing um, in their life. You're just not, but that you need their letter. Um, so yeah, and just like everybody said, like, don't, I mean, just cause you got an A in somebody's class, I mean, yeah, okay. Like this person is smart and you know, everything on their CV is true. That's like all they're gonna be able to say in their letter of rec, you know? And that's not, I mean, that's not super helpful for a program. Um, one thing also I, I would suggest is, you know, if you can get a, I would say, make sure if you're going to get more than three, I would say make sure at least two of them are from clinical faculty. Um, if I could go back and do it, I would get a fourth from somebody who was maybe somebody I externed with or like met. Um, but I think it's important that at least two, but ideally three are clinical faculty. And I know different schools start clinic at different times and maybe you haven't had a lot of clinical experience. Um, and for us, you know, all of our clinical faculty are also in um, like academia. So they kind of saw both sides of us. So it, it was a little easier for us, but you definitely want somebody who sees how you work um, because, you know, especially I think with GPRs and AGDs, they're, I mean, they don't want somebody, you know, with really bad grades, um, but I don't, I don't think they are as concerned with, you know, how you're performing in school as opposed to, okay, like, what do people have to say about how you work? Because in these programs, you know, really what we're talking about is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how you interact with patients, how organized are you, how on the ball are you, are you on time all the time, you know? So um, see somebody or talk to people who see you as a clinician uh, and less as a student. Because at the end of the day, we're clearly all good students. I mean, we got into dental school, so it doesn't tell you a ton. So then with moving on to externships, um, did you decide to do that? And what was that experience like? And if they were canceled because of COVID, because we were in that era, can you talk about that too? Um, so I got really lucky with an externship um, that I actually got from uh, one of the PEDS faculty. She knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody else. Um, uh, and then I did a couple other like day externships, like spent some time in an office, stuff like that. And I think that helped my application because uh, like I said, I was in between Perry and Pross. And so I, I got to hang out at a, um, a Pross program for a day. And then I got to hang out with one of the faculty members in his private practice. But then I also um, hung out with a periodontist. And so I got to see a day in the life of that. Um, and externships are really what you make them, you know, like you could, if you go on a week long externship, that's cool. That's great. But like a day long externship is also still an externship. I mean, an externship at the end of the day is I went somewhere and learned something outside of dental school that was related to dentistry. Um, maybe that's a half day, maybe that's a week, you know, but as long as you can talk about it and as long as you genuinely gain something from it. I think it's something worthy of putting on your CV and being able to speak about. Uh, and so if you can get them, great. But if you can't get them, don't feel like you're, you're, you're no good, you know? Yeah, um, the externships that I had planned actually got canceled uh, because of COVID. Um, it was a couple that they allowed us to do virtually, but I just don't think that was the same. But I do think externships are great just because you get to, to meet the faculty, uh, you get to meet the residents and you get to see firsthand how programs run versus just reading it online or uh emailing somebody you're seeing with your own eyes um for me i didn't get an opportunity to do an externship but i guess similar to what joe is saying even like with interviews 
um, going in person to these programs or having the opportunity to go will speak volumes to if that's something that you want to do, if that's a specialty, if it's just the environment that you want to be in. I think if the opportunity comes to you, absolutely take advantage of it. But if not, um, I mean, there are options now where it's virtual externships. I would say just get as much information and exposure to these programs and then kind of take what you learn from it, but don't feel like bad or anything if that opportunity never presents itself. Yeah, and to piggyback on what Emerald said, try to get as much experience and exposure, and gather as much information about the programs, even if you're unable to visit. But as Joseph said also, if you can visit and you know you're interested, go visit. That can be another thing that can set you apart if they're receiving a thousand applications and yours comes in and they actually know you or at least have some experience, they can put a, a face with the name and say, okay, I met this person, they did this or, you know, anything that can kind of tie it all together and make it somewhat better for you. Um, I guess I'll go back and say, I wasn't able to do externships, kind of like Joseph said, the opportunities really were really limited somewhat because of COVID. And that was one of the things I brought up in interviews. So, so I kind of turned it. I, I knew that would be a major talking point, COVID and how experiences would be were somewhat limited and we didn't do externships. And so I just talked about how, since I couldn't get the experiences elsewhere, I, it just made me work that much harder to get the experiences in-house and where I could. So people kind of appreciated that. And I just made myself present and available in the dental school. So I knew that my recommenders would, at least one of them would say that, that, oh yeah, he, he was always at school. He's always trying to do something, trying to learn. So when I said in the interview, I didn't read any of the, Record, letters of recommendation, but I knew they hit on that. So it kind of just gave me another leg to stand on. Yeah, and Brandon is always at school. So no doubt about that. <laughs> um, but I guess going into like the big, big question, what were interviews like? Like, did you do them virtually in person or like any tips for that? Um, any wild questions? that you guys even got um, during that interview process? Um, well, for me, I had one in-person and the rest were virtual. Um, they were, all of mine were actually really kind of laid back just in, they wanted me to be comfortable. Um, and we just talked about, like I said, my personal statement, talked about my clinical experiences. Uh, what do I want to gain from doing their program? Um, but it also gave me a chance. So the thing is, when you're interviewing at a residency, they're interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing them. So it gave me a chance to ask questions what I wanted to know about the program. What what are some things that you would like to see changed about your program? What are experiences, this and that? Um, and for the most part, everybody answered questions. We talked back and forth. It was just a, a real nice atmosphere. Um, now I did get some, quite, some crazy questions. Uh, and some were funny. Like one that sticks out was, he asked, if I could be any tooth in the mouth, what tooth would it be and why? And I'm like, okay, that is, he just threw that out of nowhere. I mean, we were talking about, oh, so what type of clinical experiences you have you had? And then he said, if you could be any tooth in the mouth, what would you be? Yeah, I'm like, what? Um, uh, I can't think of any more, but I know the program that I, I ultimately decided to go with they were more just asking what experiences have I had and how do, do I feel I'm gaining more confidence? Um, 
they just, I feel they wanted to know somebody that wants to come in and learn. Um, and yeah, that was my, my interview experience. Um, for me, I had one virtual interview and then I had an in-person interview. So my in-person was OU. Um, the virtual interviews, I say if you have the opportunity to go in person, go in person um, for multiple reasons. Virtual is just, it can kind of be a little awkward, especially when you have to be interviewed by multiple people and you're kind of waiting in the room and you're nervous and all of that. Um, I think the great side to that is that you can be in a space where you're comfortable, whether that's your home or somewhere that's quiet. Um, but for when I interviewed at OU, mine was a two-day interview. So I came in on a Thursday and we had a social. And I think it's great when you can get that opportunity to go to a social um, because you meet all the other people that are interviewing. But most, most important, importantly, you meet the residents. And I feel like that's when they're normally more relaxed and open to answering any questions that you may have, especially questions that you necessarily won't ask those that are interviewing you or like your program directors. Um, but the next day on Friday, my interview was, it took me back a little bit. I walked into a room and there were like five people all just sitting there staring at me. I thought it would be like one person. So at first I was like, oh, I'm so nervous. But um, everyone that was there was really kind. Um, they didn't ask any like outlandish questions. There were a few um, that I kind of had to like think about, especially like your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, things like that. Because sometimes I think we only plan for what happens tomorrow. Um, and you can be kind of honest with that as well. Uh, but all my other questions were pretty streamlined. Like, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, which I think is a question that as dental students, when we interview, we can kind of spin and talk about how our weaknesses kind of can be our strengths in ways that we can like work on them. Um, but I mean, my interview was great. I didn't have any crazy questions, I guess, like Joe, which I think that's a really interesting question. I would have been like, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, my experience was really good. Um, I had some, some pretty interesting interviews. Uh, well, so I had one in-person interview and the rest were virtual. And honestly, that in-person interview was was good because I knew like as soon as I, uh, it was kind of far out um, and just driving there and getting there and that, like the whole time I was like, I, I don't want to be here. Um, but that was important too. Um, some interesting interview question. Well, first, um, a lot of a lot of places do like like everybody's kind of been saying um, they there is a a point where you can just talk to the residents on a call and like none of the faculty are there and I think that's usually a pretty good sign for an interview if they're allowing you to do that. Um, <laughs> but the interview that does stand out and I remember telling Taylor about this. Um, I had an interview at a school. And the interview itself went well, you know, it was, it was cool that they, they, you know, they were selling the program pretty well. And it wasn't really my top choice, but I was like, oh, okay, like, I wouldn't mind going here. Um, but after that, they were like, okay, so now we'll let you talk to some of the residents here. And um, as soon as I got on the call, you know, there's this resident, she's, she's like going through her uh, notes, probably, or whatever. She's just on the computer, just looking, just pissed um and I was like hey what's up uh <laughs> she's like hey I was like ooh um and she started talking about you know just asked her the usual questions like how do you like it da, da, da. she's like it's fine I was like oh okay um so like what do you do a lot of she's like yeah you know kind of do everything but it's really just like a fifth year dental school and I don't know it's not really it's okay, you know, if that's what you want. It's still a lot of the same bullshit though, you know, like Axiom and getting swipes. So, you know, eh. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, anything, else? and so like we talked for a little bit and she was not selling the program at all. Um, and so, I, I mean, that was, you know, at, at that point I kind of knew where I wanted to go, but you know, if something like that happens, I mean, that was eye opening for me. Um, and, and, you know, I, I appreciated that, you know, for her just being as honest as possible, like, hey, I don't like it here. Um, 
another interview everything was going pretty well you know they're asking me normal questions da 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 um and then out of nowhere he says so um tell me about how you prepare an inlay tell me about retention tell me about um resistance you know what is what does that look like and i was like uh i don't really know <laughs> but th thankfully i had been studying for boards so i like kind of knew um so he asked me about inlays onlays he asked me about uh crown preparations and then he asked me you know if there was a an assistant who you asked her to get something and she didn't get it for you what would you do um and i was like that's an interesting question uh and then then he just switched into farm and then there was like a farm quiz at the end and i was like this is a lot uh <laughs> so it was just like that was a that i i think i did fine in that interview like i, I kind of held my own but it was still i i had had a couple other interviews before that so coming into that i was just like oh wow and and those interviews didn't ask me anything like that so while i don't think it's the norm um I do think, you know, you should kind of be prepared because that's, those are valid questions too. You know, they need to know what you know on the spot. Um, and if, you know, if you want to, I'll, you know, I'll have my email in, you know, at the end of this. So if you want to know what schools those were, you're more than welcome to email me and ask. Um, but yeah, they, uh, some schools will really grill you. Um, and some schools will really show you, the residents will show you who they really are. Uh, but generally speaking, like everybody else has been saying, these interviews are pretty laid back. You know, you should, you should definitely go in with the mindset that like, Hey, like, um, I'm not just some random person. Like you guys really want me. So let me ask you and see if I really want you. Um, so I think making sure you're asking questions and, you know, stuff like that, it just shows interest. And so, I mean, you, you, you all know how to interview, you interviewed for dental school. So it's really not that different. Um, I didn't, I, I, all my interviews were online. I personally love in-person interviews. So it was kind of a little different for me. Um, and one of the main things I wanted to do, uh, was to make sure I can kind of put my personality through, uh, because when you're online, it's kind of hard to kind of gauge who you are really, especially how my background is just white wall, got a plant that's, you really don't get much from that. Um, so for me, I took a lot of time in kind of prepping for an online interview. So I did looked up a bunch of YouTube videos, how I should set up certain things, um, lighting. And I took a lot of time just trying to make sure things were proper. And I don't think my light is great right now, but I didn't set it up the same way either. Um, but with these interviews, I think one of the major things is they will, when you're getting an interview, they kind of want you. And that's how I kind of looked at it. So they're just really trying to see who I am as a person who or how I fit in with their group already. Um, so a major thing that I was just really focused on was keeping things light. Um, Cause these interviews, especially when I'm not in the room with them, I can't really tell how they feel about me or maybe someone poked them and said, hey, ask this question. I don't, I can't notice those things. So a lot of the time it's more so, or I was just trying to make sure I'm answering your question, but at the same time, I'm letting you know that I don't really take too too much stuff like extra seriously and i'm really just here because i'm like i want to be here um but i'm just you know i'm a trying to convey to them that i'm a very relaxed individual um and that i'm not just going to be a stickler for everything and i'm just you know going with the flow on certain things but it kind of it was just kind of hard to doing it online and of course just with covid you know you can't really change that and this is how it is um, and I actually had some of the similar questions, Mike, uh, and I didn't know how to answer. And I said that during my interview, because also I was studying for boards as well, but it was a part I hadn't hit yet. And he asked me a question and I just looked at him and was like, so I really don't know the answer to your question. And he told me that was fine. And I'm not sure if that kind of, you know, helped me or hurt me, but it was an honest answer. And I'm not gonna sit here and lie because if I end up in your program, this is who you're getting. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, yeah, I was top of my class. I did all these wonderful things when I really wasn't that. Like, I am who I am. This is who you're, you're interviewing. This is who you saw or read the application for and wanted to interview. This is who I am. So I just made sure to give them this is 
who I am as a person. I know you can't see me as a person, but this is who I am. And I just wanted to convey that through, you know, the Zoom. Um, and I actually had one question that kind of goes back to being for your application. I had messed up and misclicked something. And for my ethnicity, I put Pacific Islander. And it's something I didn't even notice, didn't pick up on. And one of my interviews, the program director, we were just talking because we were waiting for someone to come on. And so he's like, oh, I mean, I have no questions. So where are you from? And I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? Like my personal sentence says, man, he's like, no, like you're ethnicity. I'm like, it's not obvious. Um, he was like, oh no, you kind of put Pacific Islander on here. And I was just like, oh, I, I don't, I didn't mean to do that. Like I didn't, I'm sorry. I don't know how I did that or how that happened. But um, he kind of just like, looked at me and kind of grilled me about it at first. And it just kind of turned to a joke. I'm like, so would that help me? I'm like. I didn't mean to do that at all, but if it helps, I'll, I'll be what you need me to be right now. <laughs> um, so it is always just trying to keep things light in certain issues. It's, it's be yourself, because it's not easy to do it over, you know, on a camera. Glad y'all got a laugh out of that. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> also, like, quick tip, um, like a couple different places randomly were like, um, oh, like, that's nice you're wearing a suit like I didn't I didn't expect and it's like so just because it's a virtual interview like please still wear if you don't want to wear a tie shirt for guys um and you know girls ladies totally different I don't know uh but for guys um just wear a jacket and a, a tie and a shirt you can wear sweatpants underneath whatever but like people notice these things um I was I was amazed that somebody said something about it I was like what do you mean like um and I asked them and they were like oh yeah well I mean not everybody's you know worn the whole thing I was like what <laughs> it's an interview uh so I I hope that's obvious to everybody but if it's not just and and you know for the residency socials be yourself da, da, da. don't look a mess but you know be clean cut if you want to wear the suit whatever um you know, some places the residents have more pull than other places so you want to, but for the interview, please, please be dressed like you would, at least from the waist up, like you would for a normal interview. It's, it's really not hard to do. It's a 30 minute thing, you know, come on. I would say just be fully dressed because I know for me, I actually had to end up getting up. So it's like, if I didn't have like the normal, like attire from the, my lower third, like I'm sure someone would have been like, oh, well maybe this person's not taking this as seriously. So take virtual interviews, like real interviews. Um, I think it'll go a long way. So, I mean, you can do what Mike said too. You might get lucky, but just, just you know, be safe about it. <laughs> I was dressed up from head to toe. I had the shoes, the socks, a suit, I tied up everything. So, but now I would, I wanted to say, um, when it did come to interviews, Mike had said something earlier that I, I wanted to touch on. They asked me how I was as a person, um, like how would you deal with different situations and I think once you apply if you have an interview they they're seriously they want you basically they want you there it's your job now just to say okay will this person fit with us because most program directors they're busy so they want people that's not going to cause problems and can get along with everybody in their residence so if you come in there and you show that you're a team player, you can get along with everybody, most likely they'll probably, you know, uh, lean favorable for you. But if you come in there and they're like, man, this person is going to be a headache that I do not want to deal with. And I, most likely they're not going to look at you anymore. Um, but he also said about the residents, I interviewed one place in the residence and said, yeah, you know, we're really busy, but we don't do a lot of work. We refer a lot out. I'm just like, okay, you know, what's the purpose then? Like, yeah, y'all are just there. Y'all are basically um, a receptionist from what the, it was sounding like to me. Um, yeah, but I just think also what I would say, if you can't get to the program, 
you can always email in advance before your resident uh, your interview and ask to speak with resident. Um, Taylor forced me to do this. Uh, but it helped. Like, it helped. <laughs> it, 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 it helped a lot. Taylor's like, have you spoken to any residents? I was like, no. She was like, you need to email them and, 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 and get in touch with a resident. This, this, this. And um, I was put in touch with a resident. We talked and they, when I went to interview, I told them I spoke with so-and-so, but they were like, oh, you reached out to our residents? I'm like, yeah, and all this. I reached, I researched the program as well, and I found out um, a program that they did, and when I brought that up, they all looked at me like, how do you know about that? And I was like, oh, this, this, and they were like, wow, you you know more about the program than I do, and this is coming from uh, the co-program director, so, but yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's another thing. Like, know your program. Uh, I didn't have any, you know. Well, I did have uh, one interview where they, I like, kind of knew where it was. Like, I knew it was in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't like super clear on where it was. Um, uh, and I like researched like all this stuff. Like I was on the program page and was like, oh yeah, da, 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 da. okay, talk about that, talk about that. Um, but then he was like, so you know, like what side of you know New York City we're on, right? And I was like, uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> so know your program, um, you know, and I mean, you know, to ask questions about the program while you're on the program. So make sure you're asking the right questions and make sure you're not asking stuff that you can just easily look up, um, you know. Um, I also think like, it's important to prepare for interviews, but don't overly prepare. And I, I guess I get that from my, I got that from my experience. I feel like my first interview, I was just like, I don't know what questions they're gonna ask. Like you can look online. I think Taylor, you had like a PDF as well. Um, but it's like, look at those, just know yourself and be yourself during these interviews because like everyone said, you didn't get an interview because they didn't want you. You got an interview because something stuck out to them and they can see you at their program. So just be yourself, be honest. If you don't know questions, like Harry said, just say, I don't know the questions because they, I'm sure these programs like people being honest in their honesty. So don't overly prepare for it. I know for my second interview, I was just like, they like me enough to bring me here. So let me just do what I have to do for me to like their program. That's kind of how I went into it. Um, and I felt like I was just more of myself and more relaxed. So prepare, but don't overly prepare. <laughs> One last piece of advice. If there's one thing you do before the interview, look at the mission statement. Just you can get a lot from their mission statement all alone. Just look at the mission statement. And I would say look at the mission statement, look at their web page, read all about everything you can, and then research the attendings. So go Google everybody on their page from the program director to the receptionist to the assistants and you never know you might find some information about somebody like oh that's interesting and then you bring that up they're going to be like oh you really researched her like my program i was telling the program director she's like and we have this rotation i can't remember all the rotations and i started naming them off and she's like okay and the hospitals that they're associated with or everything that if the more information you know about the program, it shows that you were really interested and wanted to learn more about them, other than just asking them questions that you could probably find out easily as well. And everyone pretty much <laughs> covered everything. I mean, all of it was good pieces of information. The only thing that I could really add is during your interview, ask questions. So if you're there, Usually in interviews and just things in general, they give you, a, there's a part or they might take a pause in between asking questions and say, have anything you want to ask me or at the end, ask them something that you actually want to know. Don't ask like, what kind of car do you drive? But <laughs> ask, so what 
if you were me, why would you choose this program? Or what makes you come back and be the director of this program every year? Like what stands out to you for this program, in your opinion, for this program? And what do you expect from residents? That's something different. That, that, and sometimes, even when I ask one of the clinical directors for the program, like um, she was a resident there and she ended up becoming an attendee. And ask her what made her choose the program. Did she feel like she got what she expected out of the program? And as a clinical director, like what makes her stay? Like what? What, what makes her want to come here every day and do this and help other people? And she was like, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, but she was honest and she, you could tell that she enjoyed it and she liked it. She was like, she started peeing down and, <laughs> and kind of answered, but you know, ask, ask questions, see, be interested. Yeah, I know um, me and Brandon, before the interview cycle started, we were actually practicing and coming up with different questions to uh, that they might ask us or we could ask them. And uh, somebody told me to ask, what's one thing that you uh, would like to do different or change about your program? And I, I think that's a, a great question because we would think, oh, that's all fine, dandy, perfect. It's, nothing's ever perfect. So I want to know what you think is something that could be better. And if you give me an honest answer on that, that shows that you're, you know, just an honest person about your program and not saying it's the best thing going. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a good process. And like your questions don't always have to be dental related too, because I feel like the program directors and your interviewees can get more of opinion of who you are. So for me, I had never been to Oklahoma. And if anybody knows me, I've lived through some terrible hurricanes. So one of my questions literally were like, well, I know Oklahoma gets a lot of tornadoes. Like, what is that like? Um, and that kind of like also put my mind at ease to know that, um, you know, this is normal, they're, they're prepared for this and just different things like that. So it was kind of not dental related. And um, I think they got to know me more or like, what are your workouts like if you go and work out or do nature things like, just let them know who you are, you know? I feel like before anyone else jumps in the Taylor transitions, what Joe said, I just want to kind of make a point he said, what would you improve? Or like, what are some challenges of your program? Like, what sucks about your program? What do you hate? Like, what's bad about your program? Not really, not the best wording. I mean, if you ask someone what's bad about their program and they don't think there's anything bad, you're like, what would you, what would you improve? You can always improve, but the way you say it might be a lot, might have uh, be received better so just kind of choose your wording wisely yeah and I, I don't know if i said it that way but yes please do not just say why does your program suck no no don't 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 say that please um and like i said i i think i said you know what are some things you would like to change or what are some things you would like to improve um like brandon said you can improve on anything and you know you can always want to change something. And like I had a program, I think they were getting ready to change program directors. One was retiring. And so I want to know what are some changes that you're inter you know, you're thinking about implementing since it's gonna be going in a new direction. And so but yes, please don't just say they suck. Oh, what sucks about the program. I was gonna say also, I mean, I know this is more about GPRs, but when I was preparing for my um, pedo interview with UIC, cause you know, Brandon knew that that was my number one and I was real nervous. So a couple days or three, two, three days before he, I would be like setting up in the clinic or I will just be doing lab work and he'll just come up to me and just say, hey, tell me about yourself or, hey, what are your strengths and weaknesses? So, so, so when you had, like, he would literally just do it just to, you know, catch me off guard, just to make sure that I was ready. Cause he was, um, he knew that UIC was my number one and that's where I'm going to be going here this summer. So um, 
you know, he, he, if you have some good people in your corner to just come up to you like randomly and just throw out some interview questions, that's, that's awesome too. So um, going into our very last question, because this has been such amazing advice. Is there any um, type of uh, information that you wish you knew before applying to GPRs or anything that you guys would have done differently? It's expensive. So of course, choose wisely um, in previous classes somewhat. I don't know how much the class of 2021 year before us had like what the experiences were with externships and if they were afforded those opportunities, how much. But usually the classes before like 2020, 2019, they did externships to make themselves familiar faces and see the programs in the city and get more experience. We didn't have that. So it wasn't like too random, but when you're selecting them, find programs that you're interested in, talk to people and if you, for example, Taylor, I'm gonna use you as an example because with UIC, when she's going, she was nervous about her number one choice, as she said. Her mentor went to the school, and so she had inside information just talking to her mentor, knowing someone that went there. And I was like, Taylor, why wouldn't you say that? Do <laughs> you know someone that can vouch for you that's told you something about the school where automatically, if I apply for UIC and I don't know anyone, that's a bit of information. Like my mentor told me this school was amazing and um, she enjoyed her time here. She told me about this program that she got this experiences. And I'm just going off of something that I read online. Hers carries a little bit more weight. So do your homework, um, use all of the resources that are available for you. Just be yourself and get it going. And you know, it's, it's kind of expensive. So just, if you do pass and match, just be mindful that pass means you could get an offer the next day. So if you pay $600 for a pass programs and $2,000 for match, you might not get to those match programs. So you may have thrown away $2,000. And look, I, I, I totally agree. I would say research your programs. <laughs> researcher programs, researcher programs, um, and be prepared. Because like he said, you might, if you do pass, be prepared for the next day. My program, I interviewed Tuesday at 12 p.m. They said, oh yeah, we'll probably start letting people know at earliest Thursday and you know on the next day, eight o'clock uh, clinic session, I'm setting up my phone ringing. I'm like, I don't know anybody from Indianapolis. This is, this is supposed to be a scam call. One of my uh, classmates told me, you better answer that phone. I answered it, and they told me right there, we want to offer you the position. But, like, it hasn't even been 12 hours, ma'am. Like, so I had to be prepared. And like Brandon said, I thought about it. It, it was expensive because I think I applied to what, 12 or 13 schools. Um, so I'm like, Jesus, I guess that's a lot of money, but, um, I would say just be researching programs, be prepared for an offer instantly. If you do pass or if you do match, just make sure you rank the ones that you're really interested in. Um, I would say the same thing. Um, Applying is very expensive, but not just that. Um, your last year in dental school is very expensive. So just be very wise on the decisions that you make. Um, and then, you know, if you're not really sure of like where you want to go or what you want to do, really sit down, make a pros and cons list and go, especially for match in terms of ranking. I know for me, I just had to sit down and consider where I want to see myself in the future. And also finances played a heavy part on my decision of where I want to go next year. So just weigh out your pros and cons and um, know that, you know, something that's not given to you now is not a denial, it's just a deferment. So just, you know, be true to yourself, um, be open to all possibilities and just have confidence in yourself 
and know that eventually you're going to end up where you need to be. Um, and a residency is, you know, one to six years, I mean, for oral surgery or longer, um, but it's just a small part of your life. So just take every experience and learn from it. Um, I would say that, like, I would agree with Emerald in a big way. Um, I mean, yes, the, I, none of us can reiterate enough how expensive it is. <laughs> it's like not cheap. So I applied to 15 or 16 school. I mean, there I applied to more, but then some had supplementals, and I was like, you know what? Nah, I'm okay. Um, so yeah, do your research, you know, all that, all that good stuff, definitely. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think what Emerald just said was really important. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up, you know, comparing ourselves to how everybody else did or how people in the year above us did, or, you know, I didn't do this, so I'm not, and I should have done this and I should just, if you want to do, I don't know, pros or perio and, you know, you didn't get in the first time, you know, don't. And then you're just going to do a GPR because, you know, oh, I, I don't, you know, I'm just, I don't have anything else to do. Like, first of all, don't treat the program like it's just a stepping stone and a backup option. You know, make sure you're, okay, I didn't get what I wanted. Now I'm going to go to this program and get everything I can out of it. Um, but, you know, if you're going to be a specialist and it didn't happen immediately, then that's fine. You know, that doesn't mean you're not a, a, a capable dentist. That doesn't mean you will never be a capable dentist. You know, all of the, I think all of the specialists I can like think of that I, I've talked to in detail, like ex except for one, like all had to do, you know, GPRs or work or, you know, do stuff in between and they're really happy now and they're doing great. So I, I, I really don't, you know, this is the dental school really is the beginning of your career. Um, and when you're done with dental school, that's the end of one part of your career. But, you know, your career hopefully is at least 20 years, hopefully more. Um, so, you know, if, if you think you need more time with a GPR or an ATD, then take that time. You know, that doesn't doesn't mean you're not ready. And maybe, you know, like me, I'm hoping it will reveal something, you know, maybe uh, during all of this, I'll be like, hey, I actually do really like endo. And then I become an endodontist. You know, you need to, you need to go into a GPR. <laughs> you need to go into a GPR or an AGD with an open mind. Um, I, I would say if you're just doing it because um, you want to get in somewhere, that's okay, but I don't think it's the best reason to do it. So if if you are, if you do end up going to one, um, you know, make sure you get everything out of it. You know, make make sure you're not just treating it like a like a penance year or like a uh, I have to do this just to beef up my application type year. Like make sure you want you're getting what you want out of it. And if you're applying to places, apply places that will help you get to that next step, and not just some random place. Yeah, what everybody said is really kind of the gist of everything. Um, let me just add to that, and we've already spoke on it. Just make sure you start early, early start full time, because it's your beginning of your fourth year, you're kind of in that point where it's like, okay, I gotta graduate. We got pictures coming up. We have all this stuff to kind of pay for now. So it's a really stressful time. So get started early. If you can be like Joe, be two year, do it. Make sure you keep all the records of things you've done to make your life a little easier. Um, and just like what Mike was saying, don't just apply to a place just to apply to a place. Um, try and pick something that's gonna help you in the future. Even if you're not necessarily sure what that future is, if you have a general idea, you can kind of find a GPR program that can kind of lead you or an AG, AEGD program that can lead you in that route. Um, and that's the main thing. You just really don't wanna just apply somewhere just to say, hey, I got in here and then get there and not enjoy it at all. Trying to pick something that's right for you, pick something that's gonna fit you and pick something that you know you can deal with for you know, at least a year, two years or whatever your program, the length may be. You just don't wanna be there just miserable the whole time. Um, and enjoy the journey. That's really all it's boiled down to. 
And I know Mike also said something. Um, if you don't get into a program, don't get down upset. You know, something better might be coming down the pipeline for you. You're going to end up where you're supposed to be. And that's that's one thing I would leave you with. All right. Um, and before we close out, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up just so that we can reach more viewers like you. Um, and <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, and do you guys have any closing remarks? Uh, where can everybody find you? Instagram, email, uh, whoever wants to go first. Okay, well, I want to say congratulations to everybody that matched. Good luck to everybody that's applying. Um, and just keep your faith, keep your focus. It's going to come about. Um, if you need to reach out to me, uh, what is my Instagram? My Instagram is T-N-F-U-T-U-R-E-D-R. -E it's Tennessee Future Doctor. Um, or you can email me at T-N-F-U-T-U-R-E-D-R, -E Tennessee Future Doctor, at gmail.com. Are you going to change that, Joe? Because you're about to be a doctor, so it won't be a <laughs> Well, that's always been my handle. I could put something else, but you can't change your email once it's set. You can't change an email. No, you just got to make a but new one. My, my so. Instagram is going to change. But once once that happens, you know, I'll, I'll update everything. They'll find me on uh, Instagram. Uh, you can email me at malyn11 at gmail.com. Uh, and that's the only way you can contact me. So. Um, you can email me at emeraldferguson1 at gmail.com. And then I believe my Instagram is emeraldbrook underscore. Um, but yeah, I feel like you can reach out to all of us and we'll all be very receptive and help out as much as we can. Um, so yeah. Also, if you want to, um, you know, I feel like you, you'll have the programs that we're all at. So just ask them if you can speak to us. So that'll, that'll help too. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at holographic underscore Harry. And you can reach me by email at harry.wallace315 at gmail.com. I'm not great with emails, um, but I will get to it if I see it. I do not have any social media that you can reach me at as of now. So <laughs> you can reach me at bra. D A D I S O N one seven at gmail.com or contact any of them and they can probably get you in touch with me. So. <laughs> okay, well, we definitely appreciate you for being on the show today. Um, and that is all that we have. So thank you for sitting with us at the table and remember to stay flossing and keep flossing. Bye, guys. Oh, 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 oh,